So today I'm going to talk about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, we're going to get this lecture out of the way in advance of Thursday, and then Thursday night we'll talk about cases with Dr. Lee. So this is just what we'll cover, some background, uh, cover the new staging system, talk about non-functional and functional tumors, uh, diagnosing each of them, talk about the different imaging modalities and what they have to offer, briefly mention hereditary sy syndrome, uh, and then we'll get into management, talk about uh, the surgical management, spend some time on the controversies there, talk about liver-directed therapies for metastatic disease, and then finally medical therapy for uh, mainly for metastatic disease. Uh, and then, like I said, on Thursday, we'll, we'll go through cases with Dr. Lee. So just some basic background information. Uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, it's really a group of different neoplasms, so uh, that'll kind of be a theme throughout this lecture that there are subtle differences between all these different tumors that we have to account for, and we'll try to cover some basic themes that apply to all, um, as well as go over some of the minor differences. So the biggest thing to get through first is that a poorly differentiated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor is really not a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. It's a carcinoma. So that's the first difference that we have to make is that a, when these things are poorly differentiated, they're classified as carcinomas, and they're actually staged entirely different with the new AJCC. They're not even in the PNET staging. They're staged like pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So when you think of PNETs, just understand you're talking about well-differentiated and moderately differentiated. They can be high-grade, but they have to be well or moderately differentiated, which is a little confusing, but um, sort of beyond the scope of this lecture. Uh, again, you have functional and non-functional. The non-functionals are going to be the most common. Functionals are going to be the ones that you're tested on that you have to know about the different syndromes, etc. cetera. Uh, low grade versus high grade, again, uh, these are all well or, or moderately differentiated, but you can still have high grade within that. Um, there's some growing literature that these should be treated differently, especially in the metastatic setting, that um, that the high-grade tumors, you have to be a little more cautious about going and doing aggressive resections, et cetera. So we'll try to cover a little bit of that. And then finally, sp uh, sporadic versus hereditary, and we'll cover some of that later. Um, so just some basic numbers on PNETs there. The incidence does seem to be rising. So this is a, a, a figure out of one of Dr. Lee's talks. Um, again, they're pretty rare, 1% to 2% for 100,000 people. But as you can see, that uh, curve is clearly going up, and that's probably related to more and more people getting CT scans and ERs, et cetera. So we're just finding a lot more of these and probably a little bit of rise in awareness as well. So quickly, we'll go over the staging of these tumors. So we have to talk about AJCC6, or I'm sorry, 7, and now 8. And then we have to talk about the European staging as well. So this is kind of a big, busy slide. We'll go through it piece by piece. But you can see here, you have the 8th edition, the 7th edition of AJCC, and then you have ENETs, and now the new modified ENETs. And you'll see that the modified ENETs and AJCC 8 are fairly similar. So let's talk about T staging first. So uh, the breakdown now is basically just by size. So T1 is less than 2 centimeters, T2, 2 to 4 and then T3 is greater than 4, or this one caveat, uh, and this figure didn't actually have it in here, but the AJCC manual has it in there, greater than 4 centimeters or into the duodenum or bile duct. These are considered T3, and then T4 is basically your uh, vascular invasion, so into the celiac or SMA, basically an unresectable. So 8th edition versus 7th edition. The 7th edition used to have this tumor extends beyond the pancreas, sorry, tumor extends beyond the pancreas, it would make it a T3, and there was no four centimeter cutoff. The new, again, is uh, less than two, two to four, and then four or into the duodenum and bile duct, but extra pancreatic invasion is no longer in the staging. Apparently that was uh, too variable by the pathologist, so they just took it out. And then T4, again, is unresectable because of vascular invasion. So now let's look at the American versus European staging. Uh, and again, this is the newer European staging. Pretty similar, two, two to four, greater than four, or into the duodenum or common bile duct, so essentially the exact same. And they just say invades adjacent structures, so they don't uh, specify vascular. But as you can see, the modified ENETs in the, in the eighth edition are essentially the same as far as T staging. So next, uh, we'll go into nodal staging. The big thing to note here is that um, the 
all the older ones and even the new European staging just say yes or no. The new AJCC does break it down with one to three nodes versus four or more. So they did see a difference in survival between those two. So that's an addition to the new staging. And then uh, as far as METs, you have yes or no. That's pretty straightforward. And then just briefly, I wanted to cover um, the actual stages. So I think it's beyond the scope to try to memorize all these stages. But one thing I just wanted to note is stage three is actually, or I'm sorry, stage two includes N1 disease, but does not include T4. And then stage three is is T4 with with even without node positive disease. So any T4 is a stage three, uh, and N1 with T1 to three is actually a stage two. So these T4s without nodal disease actually do worse than the uh, T1 to 3 with node positive disease. I thought that was uh, kind of interesting and something to note. And you see even the Europeans include the same thing. N1 disease is stage 2. T4 disease is stage 3. So T4 obviously uh, portends a worse prognosis. So let's talk about the diagnosis of these. And this is pretty basic background stuff, but stuff that I think you know is important to know for the boards and stuff like that. So functional versus non-functional. So the key here, non-functional, because they don't function, they don't have symptoms, they present later. They tend to present at a later stage. The tumors are much larger, and they typically present because of symptoms, because of this large uh, tumor or from metastatic disease. Whereas functional peanuts are often going to present much early on with a lower stage because they have symptoms, particularly gastronoma and insulinoma present uh, generally very early in, in the course. So this is a busy slide that goes over all the different syndromes. So we're going to go through these one by one. Um, non-functional, one thing to keep in mind is that just because it's not non-functional doesn't mean it's it doesn't secrete anything. So even the non-functionals, the vast majority of them will secrete some sort of peptide. It just doesn't cause a syndrome, so it doesn't cause symptoms. So again, when they, when they present, it's usually related to the mass, some sort of symptoms from that. Uh, they're all in the pancreas, and they are generally malignant. So this could just be because they present later, but uh, you know that's just the thing to know is that they're generally going to be malignant, so you're going to be a little more aggressive with them. So again, the majority are over 5 centimeters, so they're all going to be T3 or T4. Uh, I shouldn't say all, but the majority are going to be T3 or T4. Uh, and 60% will, will present with synchronous liver met, so they present late. Chromogranin. A is something that you know we were probably all taught in med school and residency, but I know here uh, the staff are not a big fan of it. It's 60 to 100% sensitive, a wide range, and it's probably on the lower end of that range. Um, so uh, I don't think it's a very useful marker, something we might be tested on, but in real life it's not very useful. So let's start going through these uh, symptomatic ones uh, one by one. So insulinoma, things you need to know for this. It is the most common sporadic functional, so uh, non-familial, a non-men one related specifically, uh, but the most common, uh, it's still very rare, obviously. These are again going to present early, generally less than two centimeters, uh, and they're found equally throughout the pancreas. EUS is uh, purported to be the uh, best localizing mo modality, and typically that's going to be include an intraoperative ultrasound as well. Um, so the thing about the thing to know about these, the vast majority are going to be solitary, sporadic, and benign. So the surgical management when we get to that is going to be a little less aggressive for insulinomas because, again, they're going to present early and 90% are going to be benign. So as far as diagnosing an insulinoma, uh, the gold standard is a 72-hour fast and then testing for multiple things. So you need a low glucose with a high insulin, high C-peptide, high pro-insulin, and low beta hydroxybutyrate and no sulfonylurea in the urine. Um, it's the gold standard for diagnosing these. So next, moving on to gastronoma. Uh, so Zollinger Ellison syndrome, everybody knows about that. Uh, presentation, gastronoma triangle, and then uh, one big differentiator here. These are the vast majority of these are going to be malignant, whereas insulinomas were benign. Uh, so these are the second most common functional PNET. In the sporadic, they're the most common associated with MEN1. Again, they're found in the gastronoma triangle. 70% will be in the duodenum, so you need to do a duodenotomy to look for these. We'll talk about that with surgical management a little later. Um, and then 
the majority of the rest are going to be in the pancreas, with some being in the adjacent tissue within the gastronomic triangle. 30% um, are associated with MEN1, so most of what I read recommended that every patient with a gastronoma be tested for MEN1. Uh, again, 90% are malignant, and a third are going to present with metastatic disease, so that'll come into play when we talk about surgical management a little bit. It's going to be a little more aggressive than an insulinoma. Uh, interesting thing that I read was that the incidence of metastatic presentation is actually increasing with the use of PPI. So these patients have symptoms, but they're treated with a PPI, their symptoms are controlled, and that actually uh, means that they're going to present at a later stage, almost like a non-functioning neuroendocrine tumor. Um, so testing for this, uh, need to be off of PPI for a week because the PPI will mess up the gastrin level, obviously. So you're going to test for two things first. Uh, a serum, uh, excuse me, a, a fasting serum gastrin level, and then a gastric pH. Uh, if the fasting or if the fasting serum gastrin is normal and the gastric pH is over two, then you don't have a gastrinoma. So you can exclude that. Um, and the, about forty percent of the patients with a gastrinoma will have a fasting serum gastrin that's ten times the normal. So if you have that and a low pH, you basically guaranteed a gastrinoma. And then the other 60% are going to be in between. So their serum gastrin is going to be elevated, but not 10 times normal. And their pH will be less than 2. So for those patients, that's where you do the, um, the secretin test. And then uh, you can also do a, a BAO. So BAO greater than 15 uh, diagnoses it. Or the thing, we, the thing I think is tested more frequently is uh, a secretin stimulation test. So typically secretin should decrease your gastrin. If you give secretin and the gastrin goes up, then that's a gastrinoma. So just briefly, I want to mention the gastrinoma triangle. I'm sure everybody knows this, but the junction between the head and the neck of the pancreas, uh, usually people say between the third and fourth portion of the duodenum, and then the cystic duct, duct and the common bile duct. So glucagonoma, um, so the syndrome we'll talk about, the four Ds, uh, all these are in the pancreas, and again, most of these are going to be malignant. These are usually in the tail. They do present a little bit later, so typically larger mass, and most of them are going to be metastatic at the time of diagnosis. Um, the uh, rash associated with these is called uh, NME, or necrolytic migratory erythema. Uh, it does present in the, it is present in the majority of patients. These are a couple pictures of it. Um, and then the four Ds uh, that are associated with this, dermatitis, diabetes, depression, and DVT. So they do get blood clots as well. Uh, and then diagnosis is by a very high gluca glucagon level. Uh, and then symptoms as well as imaging. Uh, and then now we're getting into the more rare things. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly go over these. So VIPoma, um, the Werner Morrison syndrome, and the acronym of this is WDHA, watery diarrhea, hypokalemia, aquarhydria, uh, and this is just met, diagnosed with a VIP over 500. And then just very briefly, these very rare things, these are the other typical hormones that a functioning neuroendocrine tumor can produce, so somatostatin, so these patients are going to get gallstones, diabetes, uh, weight loss, diarrhea, and then uh, again, these are going to generally present a little bit later uh, with mass-related symptoms. Most of these are going to be uh, malignant as well. And then other things, uh, growth hormone release, releasing factor, ACTH, PTH, RP, uh, and then serotonin. So these are, uh, peanuts can actually cause carcinoid syndrome, which we typically don't think of uh, as being from the pancreas, but that can happen as well. Uh, and these things are you know, fairly rare, so I don't want to go too crazy on them.